Okay, so I guess we can get started. Right, so uh, welcome to this talk. Okay, so just to say that we do need to uh, stop at uh, 4 p.m. sharp because there will be another uh, lecture. So they will keep us out, unfortunately. Sorry about that. But I'm very excited to uh, introduce you Tian Xie. Okay, so he's currently a senior researcher and also project lead at Microsoft Research AI for Science. I mean, so he's definitely a very influential figure in the uh, research world of uh, uh, you know, machine learning applied to material science. And uh, he's going to tell us about basically Microsoft's latest uh, efforts. Okay, that also Satya actually uh, you know, uh, gives a thumbs to uh, this project. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Li Jim, for the really nice introduction. Also, the greater, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's so nice to be here in person at uh, Imperial. Uh, so, uh, okay, yeah. How do, yeah, how do I just get rid of this uh, presenter mode? These display settings, yeah. There is this display settings at the top. Uh, duplicate. Okay, that works. Nice. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think uh, before before we get started, maybe give me a bit of a hands up to let me know what's the audience here. So uh, are you if you are like uh, from more like ML background, uh, can you raise your hand? Okay. Uh, if you are from materials background, raise your hand. Nice. Okay. Very good. Uh, like even spread. So I think that would be a good. Uh, uh, like good talk for you because uh, I think uh, they are both like materials and ML. Uh, uh, so I think uh, I because this talk is pretty long, so I will probably skip a bunch of this. Uh, but I would kind of also encourage uh, kind of I will stop in the middle so that you can ask questions. So I don't expect this to kind of uh, I, I don't expect us to finish until we are kicked out. So, but uh, I I think I would rather to have more discussion uh, than us to kind of have to go into the end. So yeah, so again, uh, very nice to be here. Uh, so most of the things I'm going to talk today uh, will be in this like, archive paper that we released last December. Uh, so first, uh, just a, a very very brief overview about uh, uh, Microsoft Research AI for Science. We are a new institution that was announced around one and a half years ago, uh, led by uh, Professor uh, 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 Chris Bishop, who is the author of the very famous paper, uh, Machine Learning and Pattern Recognition. Uh, so we are a global team uh, with the multiple sets around the world. I'm based in Cambridge here in the UK, uh, but we work very closely with folks in like Europe, uh, in China, and uh, in North America. Uh, so I think we, uh, so why we are doing AI for Science, right, at uh, MSR, I think uh, at first, AI for Science is important. Uh, uh, many of us in the team believe that this is probably one of the most important things we want to work on. Uh, in the field. Uh, and uh, I think one unique thing we are trying to build here is really this convergence of people from different domains, deep domain expertise of the domain and also deep machine learning and large scale compute. Uh, we are highly interdisciplined team hoping to solve some of the biggest uh, problems aiming to have real world impact in the world. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so today I'm going to talk about Metagen. So I wanted to start just by highlighting that this is a highly collaborative teamwork that was coming from our team uh, in, in, in the past one and a half years. And uh, so the core team, uh, the seven people uh, was listed here, but also we have our amazing interns and many other researchers across our uh, MSR AI for Science who all contributed highly significant to the work and it's not possible for Metagen to come out without the, like, the deep collaborations from everybody in the team. Uh, so I think most of you know, material design is one of the cornerstone, right, for, for modern technology. So many of the problems we are facing today, they are all bottlenecked by finding a better material. For example, if you have better battery material, your electric cars can run faster, right? So if you can have a good carbon capture material, uh, then that can absorb carbon CO2 from the atmosphere. This could lead into a trillion dollar industry because uh, everybody knows that uh, uh, there the, the will be an important uh, industry to remove CO2 from atmosphere for us to achieve the carbon zero that was predicted right by 2050. So it's a very important area. Uh, 
so the core problem in materials design is really trying to find the materials uh, whose properties satisfy the design requirements for the application. So in here, I'm showing you a slide uh, that I steal from Professor Xu Ping Ong, which designs, uh, which shows you a few requirements that was needed to find a good solid state electrolyte material for the lithium ion batteries. So usually, uh, each one of these properties you can calculate using quantum mechanical calculations. So therefore, the core problem here really is to find a material uh, which are stable and also satisfy all these property constraints. And that's the core cool problem that we're trying to solve here. So traditionally, in the past, uh, I would say decade, right? So it's been pretty influential to basically achieve this material design via screening-based methods. So the idea is that you start with maybe a 10,000, 1,000 uh, material candidates, and you run these calculations for each one of these properties, and gradually filter down the candidates uh, so based on the constraints that I have described earlier. So at the end, you may have like five to 10 different candidates that you were then send into the lab for experimental synthesis. So it will, if it was successful, you may find the, the next battery material that is put into a commercialization. So I want, so in the past, like I would say maybe two to three years, there's a lot of work that are trying to use AI to accelerate this process. So I'm, I'm gonna highlight a few like uh, paper that was, uh, made a major impact, but uh, there was uh, much more than that. So, so one, one thing I think many of you may have heard is that this uh, genome work that just coming out of Google DeepMind, where they developed an active learning loop to iteratively explore novel materials uh, by, joined, uh, by using substitution over existing materials and jointly training a machine learning force field uh, uh, using the data that was generated by density functional theory along the way. So at the, what the end is that they were able to expand the known space of materials by 10 times, basically enlarging this initial set of candidates that you would normally screen for different materials. Uh, so there's also a more recent release from us, uh, Microsoft uh, Azure Quantum, that's a different team uh, that we work very closely, where they basically, they, 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 so the goal here is really to accelerate the simulation, right? So normally the simulation was done using quantum mechanics, which was super slow, but you can learn machine learning surrogate models to significantly accelerate the process. So what they did is that they trained a machine learning surrogate model, which is a thousand times faster, and then they screened the candidates and all the way, and then proposed the candidates and went all the way to the lab and discovered a new battery material experimentally that have 70% lithium uh, uh, compared with the normal uh, commercial battery material. Uh, but of course, there's a lot more work in this area. Uh, so, uh, so given this context, right, we think it's very clear that one of the next frontier in this space is really generative materials design. So the best thing you can do today with screening is basically the, the space that I have just described, right? You can at most access 10 to the order of five to 10 to the order of six materials for the problem that you're interested in. But uh, there's only, this is only a tiny space over the potential material that is available that is on the order of 10 to the 10 to 10 to the order of 12 uh, materials. So actually this number was coming from uh, uh, Professor Aaron Walsh's group, who is actually here at uh, Imperial. Uh, so, uh, so therefore in order to access this space, right? So you needed to, so the only way to do that is probably be a generative model. So, so this motivates us why we develop MetaGem. So this is uh, one of the words first, a model that demonstrating that you can perform properly guided material generation for a broad range of different materials properties and constraints. And uh, this is, I think, the first step of enable generative model materials design uh, for the future. So in, the, in, in today's talk, I'm going to kind of go through this list as outlined here. First, I'm gonna to try to define what are the materials, right? How do you, how do you define the mathematical layer? Uh, etc. And then I'm going to talk about so the core thing, which is the diffusion model that we have for materials. And then I'm going to talk about how you train this model, how you can generate noble and stable materials. And, and then I'm going to talk about the conditional generation. And finally, I'm going to give you one example of how you can apply this model to a more realistic materials design problem. So, okay, let's get started. So first, what are materials? Here we are talking about a more specific type of material called a crystalline material. Uh, so, th so these are the kind of the solid material you see, for example, in batteries and the solar cells. 
so here I'm showing you the structure of a one material called a lithium copper oxide, which is the material that won the Nobel Prize uh, because it's such an important component for the battery material today. So in the real world, it can form in different form. It can be a powder form or it can be a crystalline form. But uh, if you're looking at the atomic structure, it is a periodic structure over the three-dimensional space of atom arranging in this periodic form. So I want to note that in here, this atom can come from all the elements in the periodic table. So that's a pretty unique thing compared with, the, for example, mole small molecules or like proteins where these atoms are usually just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Uh, so another unique thing up here is the, is the uh, periodicity. So uh, in order to represent this crystalline material, right? So uh, one thing that people usually do is looking at its smallest repeating unit. So in order to represent that, you need to define uh, N atoms in the periodic cell called a unit cell. And uh, this, you, you need to define the type of these atoms. You need to define the autonomous co uh, coordinates of these atoms. And then you need to define letters, which are three vectors that defines the periodicity of the material along three dimensions. Uh, in the three-dimensional space. So once you define the unit cell, right? So then what you can do is that you can kind of uh, translate this unit cell using any integer combinations of these lattice, three lattice vectors that you can tile the three-dimensional space to form an infinite periodic structure. Uh, so here I note that in here we're actually using fractional coordinates. It's a number between zero and one that basically use uh, the three lattice vectors as a basis to describe the location of the atoms uh, inside the unit cell, but it's quite easy to convert that into Cartesian coordinates just by doing a matrix multiplication dot product compared with uh, the uh, lattice vector. Uh, so now, once we, now that we define, right, what is the space of materials, right? So this is what this is the mathematical space of materials that we just defined. Then the next question is how do you know which one of the material is stable, right? Because uh, you, you can you can in principle if for given two elements, you can in principle form infinite different periodic arrangement of atoms, right, in a thin dimensional space. But which one of them are stable, right? So we only want them to generate stable materials. In order to do that, we need to go a little bit of physics. Uh, so, so basically in this plot, this is called a phase diagram. So here I'm just, a, so each dot is a different periodic arrangement of atoms in the three-dimensional space. And the x-axis is the composition ratio of A uh, within the A and the B. And the y-axis is the energy. So you can imagine that once I plot all different periodic arrangement of atoms in this plot, right? So it will kind of, a, uh, created many, many different dots with different structures corresponding to different energies. So once you have all these dots, then the, then you kind of draw a convex hull, and the structures on the lowest convex hulls are those ones that are stable. Uh, so there's a physics in between it, which is basically you want to always go to lower energy. So therefore, if you have an energy structure, you will decompose into a lower energy structure. And if you're kind of in the middle, you can, so, you know, for example, yeah. right, so if you have this thing here, you will decompose into this and this. So that's how, how kind of physics work. So now let me introduce an important concept called energy above the how, uh, which is basically uh, which which is basically the distance of this the, your energy with respect to this how. So uh, it, it is known that uh, material is stable if you're on the convex how, but uh, they can be metastable, meaning uh, they are not purely stable, but uh, they can still be synthesized. For example, diamond is one example that is matter stable. Uh, so, but usually uh, people think uh, if it's between 0 0.1 EV per atom, uh, then you are stable. So the, all this energy you can compute it with quantum mechanics, and that is how we define how materials are stable uh, in our problems. Uh, you can imagine that you can evaluate, right? Any, any crystal you generate, you can evaluate it here. So, okay, so now we have uh, like defined, the, the, uh, we have introduced the, the physics. Uh, so I can formulate this now as a machine learning problem. Uh, so the problem for our genetic model, right, is to, uh, to jointly generate atom types of positions and uh, lattice, which defines a periodic structure. And the goal is to generate all matter-stable materials up to 0.1 EV per atom uh, for all the materials. Uh, 
across the periodic table. That, so that's the definition of our genetic problem. And uh, but uh, in in fact, in here we're actually looking at uh, a regime we, where you are not you you don't have infinite data, right? So we're not talking about language models. We're talking about uh, uh, geometric objects. So it'll be really nice if you can bring in some inductive bias, let's say the geometric uh, inductive bias, uh, symmetry, rotational equivalence into the model uh, so that you can best leverage the small amount of data that you have. Uh, in addition, you want to capture periodicity, you, are, you wanted to kind of easily add different conditions into the model. So these are some of the criteria uh, for us to design our models. Uh, so now let me go to, I'm going to the, talk a little bit more about the model itself. So I want to, yeah, go ahead. So we use that to generate the training data. So yes, but uh, it's not explicitly built into the model. Yes, good question. Yeah, so if there are any questions, right, feel free to ask. No? Okay, let's move on. <laughs> okay, so now uh, let's talk about our model. Our model is a diffusion model. I think uh, maybe uh, most people here are reasonably familiar with that, but if you're not, you can look at this tutorial. But at the highest level, right, so the diffusion model is trying to run a, a denoising model that generates from uh, generates the data uh, from a given noise. So so in, in a diffusion model, it's a, it's a, it's what you usually do is that you start with your data distribution and you define a noising process, uh, usually adding Gaussian noise, right? So, and you iteratively adding uh, Gaussian noise into the data until your data distribution approaches a limiting distribution, which is uh, usually a known distribution you can sample from, like a Gaussian distribution. At the same time, you would learn a denoising model which would be able to denoise, uh, to predict the clean data from the noise of the data. Uh, so, and, uh, so therefore, once you have the denoising model, then you can sample from the limiting distribution generating novel uh, data uh, by just iteratively applying this, uh, uh, this denoising model. Uh, so in, in Metagen, right, so our core uh, is really, so the core problem we're trying to solve is really about how would you design this forward corruption process as well as how would you design the score network that would be able to reverse this process, right? So these are the two key problems that we're trying to solve uh, and design that clearly for crystalline periodic systems. Uh, so so let's, let me first go through the corruption process. How would you corrupt the atom types and positions, right? Uh, and the letters uh, to define the diffusion process here. Uh, so the key thing here is that uh, uh, we, act in the forward corruption process, we actually do a factorization. So we don't, uh, cor so we actually co corrupt each one of these comp components uh, independently. We define a corruption process over the item types and the fractional coordinates and the uh, and periodic lattice uh, using a set of a customized diffusion process for them independently. Uh, but I, I just want to note that even though in here, in the forward process, we are assuming independent corruption for each one of these components, but the reverse model, you're, stu uh, you're, learning, you're still learning all this denoising process jointly. You're learning a single model to denoise all this corruption process. That's also the standard practice for molecule generation as well. Uh, so, but uh, we, we tried, so in each one of these corruption process, we try to build in more uh, inductive bias that was specific for materials. So let's talk first to start with atom type uh, diffusion. So in here, uh, atom type is a, a categorical variable that can select from any types uh, for elements in the periodic table. So therefore here we take a standard approach called D3PM, uh, which uh, try, is, defines the diffusion process over categorical variables. In here, uh, the corruption process is defined by a Markov transition matrix that corrupts this uh, 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 this category variable, and you can design this to be any Markov transition matrix. But we tried out different options. But at the end, the best uh, option was the this one called a mass categorical diffusion process. So, so the general idea is that uh, you have certain probability for each state to transit into a master state, uh, and then you then for each element, but uh, they will not come back. Uh, uh, but uh, once you are in this master, you will not come back. So the 
forward process is everything become this master state. Well, the reverse process is that uh, you uh, you basically generate these elements from the master state. So I think one more like uh, uh, challenging but also more interesting diffusion process is for the fractional coordinates uh, because you have to capture the geometry of the coordinates, uh, which uh, which has a periodic geometry. So thinking about an atom right inside a unit cell. Uh, if you're moving the atom from one side of the cell, it will actually come back, right? So the question is, how would you actually capture this periodicity in the forward corruption process? So in here, uh, we got inspired from this paper called a torsional diffusion paper, which actually defines the corruption process for these torsional angles, which has a very similar geometry as our problem. So the torsional angle is just the uh, angle between bonds for molecules that can take any value between minus pi and pi. It also has a similar periodic geometry, right? If you go from outside of a pi, you cannot go back from minus pi. So therefore, so the idea is that, uh, so the diffusion process for this object, which has uh, called a, a torus uh, geometry, uh, you can describe it using something called a rough normal diffusion, uh, which uh, is basically you are summing over much of uh, a set of a Gaussian distribution each centered around the zero, two pi, minus pi, four pi, et cetera, and uh, uh, summing at least up to infinity. And then in the forward process, you just increase the variance of this Gaussian distribution. So therefore at the limit, you will approach a uniform distribution between minus pi and two pi, uh, minus pi and pi. This will give you a very good uh, intuition because uh, you, want to, you want these torsional angles to be kind of uniform, right? Inside this uh, periodic space. And this is also mathematically easy because it's just the sum over Gaussian distribution. Uh, so then you can extend this from 1D to 3D uh, very easily, uh, where the periodic system is just the 3D torus. Uh, and then you, you just define this uh, rough normal over the three dimensional space. So one special thing we did here was that we actually uh, rescale this uh, variance based on the number of atoms. So the reason is because we, here we define the, the diffusion in fractional coordinates, between, which is only between zero and one, right? So, uh, but then if you have a bigger crystal with more atoms, the variance will intrinsically be bigger, right? Because it's, it's, it's so the, the, because the diffusion is defined between zero and one. So therefore we kind of risk that uh, based on the cubic root of the number of atoms so that in the Cartesian space, they have a similar variance uh, in here. So uh, finally, let me talk about uh, lattice diffusion, uh, which is a diffusion of these uh, uh, three lattice vectors. So in here, the key thing we hope to capture is uh, that we wanted to uh, remove a additional rotation degree of freedom here, because you can imagine if you rotate the entire crystal together with these three lattice vectors, right? So then the entire crystal will not change. So when you want to get rid of this rotational invariance here, so therefore what we did is that we do this uh, polar decomposition, which basically decomposes these lattice vectors into a rotation matrix and a trick matrix, and we only do diffusion in this metric matrix. And uh, another thing that uh, uh, we introduced here for the lattice diffusion is that we adjust the limiting mean and the variance for the, for, the, for the lattice diffusion. So let me explain what that does that mean. So if you are familiar with the normal uh, the uh, diffusion process, right? So it's called a variance uh, preserving diffusion process that at the limit, right? So uh, for your variable, you will have a, a Gaussian that is centered around zero uh, at, uh, at a distribution. But for the lattice, that's not optimal because uh, you have a, if you have very small lattice factor, usually it means uh, in one dimension, it's almost zero, that it's, it's going to be a highly skewed lattice that cause a lot of a, instability during the training. So the idea is just to, to add additional terms so that uh, uh, the mean and mean will not be zero. It will actually be a cubic, which is also uh, quite uh, reasonable from physics. And also we rescale the cubic uh, so that it scales together with number of atoms in the unit cell. So this uh, significantly improves the training stability. We don't train that. How would you train that mu n? Uh, mu n is a function of n. 
So you have like a bigger, bigger meal if you have a, uh, you have a, that's the, that's the, let's so say it's like, a, if, a, if you have more atoms, you have a, like a big cube. That's uh, as, okay. yeah, yeah, true, 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 true. Very simple. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now uh, let me move on. So I have talked about the diffusion process, right? So we kind of build a little bit of a customized diffusion process for the atom types positions and letters. Uh, so uh, jointly, they will be a, they will corrupt the crystal into a random crystal. At the limit, you will have all master state with the cubic letters, which all the atoms are uniformly distributed, which looks quite reasonable from the physics. So therefore, in the reverse process, we are going to learn a score network, right? So that could reverse this process. And uh, obviously, uh, we would like this score network to be equivalent. So in here, you, this, this score network just takes in a, a, a crystal uh, with periodic structure, and it outputs three, three scores. One is the atom type score. Second is the coordinate score. Last is the, 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 uh, the letter score. And we hope the entire thing to be equivalent. And so the two key problems we need to handle, one is handle periodicity. Uh, and the second is you want to handle the equivalence with respect to the letters because uh, handling equivalence over the coordinates is like well known uh, in many, many other papers. Okay. So uh, by the way, we use GMNET here if you want you, you want to ask. Okay, so, so to handle the periodicity, so actually I'm going back to one of my very old work. So you might be already quite familiar with that, but for some audience, maybe not. So I, I, want, I think it might be useful to introduce. So in order to period, represent a periodic crystal, right, inside a graph, you need this multi-graph representation, meaning you must allow multiple edges between two set of end nodes in order to represent this crystal. Let me explain why this is the case for this simple example. Here you have a crystal right, with two atoms, uh, cesium and chromium at, at their location. But because it's a periodic structure, if you look at the neighbors of the center atoms, so it actually has six A neighbors, right? Because it's a periodic structure. Uh, and all these a, seven eight other neighbors, they are actually periodic images of the original atom. So therefore, if you represent this as a graph, uh, you will actually have a graph with two nodes and eight, eight edges. And in each one of these edges, you need this special label just to denote that how would you translate this, uh, this atom I uh, 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 a lot based on the lattice factors, right? Uh, in order to form this edge. Uh, so this is the multi-graph representation for periodic systems. And uh, so, uh, so if, you, if you have this graph, then it's actually quite easy to compute this uh, edge vector, which is a vector between i and j, uh, given this label k, uh, just by first translating the item i with k, and then do a, do, do a dot product with l. Uh, so, but uh, once you actually can compute this l, uh, this, uh, this uh, edge vector, right? So you can actually, for any graph neural network architecture, any equivalent graph neural network architecture, you just replace uh, the, the edge lattice vector for non-periodic system with this uh, lattice vector for periodic system, then, then you can just adapt anything to a periodic graph neural network. So that's, that's how you handle, in most cases, periodicity for, uh, for, for, for in graph neural network, for equivalent graph neural network. Okay, so now let's handle the second question, which is uh, the equivalence lattice score. Uh, so in order to understand this, I think it's probably better to first uh, uh, discuss how does GymNet handle non uh, the equivalence with respect to coordinates. So I know that there are so many different ways to do this, but uh, at least in GymNet, as well as EGN, which is another very famous architecture, it was done in the following way. So the equivalent score for each node is basically the sum of all these edge vectors which is uh, not learnable, right? And uh, at times with a scalar, uh, uh, which is not single number, but it's learnable using the edge embeddings, MIJ. Uh, so therefore you are kind of just uh, reweighting these edge vectors so that you can output a score that will rotate together, right? With respect to all your neighbors. 
So, but, uh, but for this, uh, so I have physics background. You can explain this uh, using, uh, using physics uh, knowledge. So one way to think about this is that you can actually assume that uh, there is a artificial energy function that uh, is uh, for the entire systems, but then you can decompose this energy over each edge uh, with respect to uh, atoms. Then you can do a bit of a chain rule, do a bit of a math. Then you would uh, real, oh, sorry, this is a, oh, good. So then you do a bit of a chain rule. Then this first term, which is the derivative of energy with respect to the distance, uh, can assume be any scalar number that you can learn. And then the second term will basically take the exact form as uh, we described before dij k, hey, but uh, kind of normalized by distance here. So I think the good advantage of taking this picture is that then you can apply the same rule also to lattice, right? Because in here, dij was a function of both x and l. So therefore, you can then get in this equation, uh, which, uh, which is basically very similar to the above one, but with this additional term here. And uh, that is uh, an output that will also rotate together. Uh, that is output for lattice, equivalent output for lattice, but that will rotate together with the input. Uh, but uh, actually there is, uh, so what, but this is a, but uh, in the final form, we actually added another term here, which is the L, uh, because we realized that if you add this additional L, uh, this entire thing was uh, still equivalent, but also will be a symmetric matrix. So remember that uh, we do the diffusion in this symmetric form. So therefore, uh, so, so therefore you kind of match this two so that uh, your score network will, will, will output something that is both equivalent and symmetric. So yeah, that's the major thing, which was uh, I have kind of a described how we designed the forward diff corruption process. I've also described how do we define an equivalent score network for periodic systems that outputs this. So I think I will go ahead. Yeah. Yes. It's not equivalent. Uh, yes. It's not, uh, you're not preserving equivariance in the discharge, in the double process. And then in the bubble process, you, you require equivariance. So would this kind of asymmetric requirement okay. can have some interesting? That's a, that's a wonderful question. Yeah. So basically, uh, in a forward process, right, we, 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 we basically select a fixed rotation, right, in the forward diffusion process, right? Uh, but uh, in the reverse process, because the, the, the score network is equivalent, right, so then it means that uh, basically for, uh, you can generalize this fixed rotation diffusion to a new rotation, you know, new input that is kind of a rotated version of the same thing. That's one aspect. Uh, but a second aspect, which is uh, smaller, but uh, I would say, uh, so here we're talking about the global equivalence, right? But uh, if you, but uh, all this graph neural network, they, they, they're all learned based on local information, I would say. So, but uh, in, in materials, there's a lot of uh, local structures that are just a rotated version of each other. So we suspect that uh, introducing equivalence will also be helpful here, but uh, I think empirically, it's clear that equivalence is useful, but uh, these are some of the explanations. Yes. Yeah, uh, in between data, you won't, you won't be able to see all the possible sort of like uh, transform, yeah. right? It's, it's an equivalent group. So that you want to somehow decompose first, you have to separate the part that based on one link equivalent and the other yeah. confused. Yes. And then this will allow you, for example, to say, print on a single wheel and then generalize to like yeah. the, the entire part. That's correct. Cool. Yeah, good question. That, I like this question. So any more questions from the audience? Great. Okay, so now let me move on. I think uh, this is the key ML part. I think uh, the rest of them will be more about uh, materials. Uh, so now you have this model, right? Then the question is how would you train it? That's the key thing. So now what we do is we actually curate the training data set and remember our learning objectives that you wanted to generate automatic stable materials, right, with the periodic uh, table. So therefore, uh, we actually combine three different data sets. Uh, one is the materials project, which is the most popular data set that many people use. But we added two additional sources. One is this called so-called Alexandria data set, 
which is also from open source, but they did a, a very big exploration that includes around a million materials. And uh, there's the last one is ICSD, which is a proprietary commercial database incorporating experimental materials. Uh, so, but uh, this this data set we come we do DFT on uh, all of them, compute their energies, construct a complex hub, and we limit ourselves into twenty atoms and uh, define materials that are stable within the open one EV. And then this gives us this training data of uh, six uh, six hundred and seven thousand uh, data points, which is fifteen times bigger than the very popular MP twenty data set that was only coming from the materials project. So, uh, so we, we use this data to train our model, and then you can generate some crystals. This uh, set of randomly selected crystals from the set. Uh, so if you are a material scientist, then you will realize that they look quite reasonable uh, from a material science perspective. And they, have, uh, they, are, they look symmetric. They have reasonably local structures. No atoms are colliding, et cetera. But of course, we want to do, do, do deeper. We want to have a quantitative evaluation, right? So, which is always a hard problem. So, therefore, especially for genetic models, so we spend a lot of time thinking about this. But uh, the key metric we can come up with is the following. So, you need to understand whether or not the materials are stable, where is the stable was defined by as uh, what I described, zero point one EV per atom, how much how, and you want to know whether or not the structure are generating they are diverse, that right? Whether or not they are duplicates of each other. So, therefore, we we count the percentage of non-duplicated materials. Uh, finally, you, you don't want to regenerate those from training data, so we count to the percentage of novel structures. And combining all of them, you got a stable, unique, and novel, uh, and abbreviated with, as some, which was a very good uh, abbreviation for the, <laughs> for the materials we discover. And <laughs> that's the key metric that we're going to look at. So, and uh, we compared with uh, some st past uh, state-of-art models, uh, CDVAE, uh, which is from um, my own research, but there's some of uh, our some newer models that were also published quite recently that were actually outperforming CDVAE, but we did not compare with them yet. Uh, so, uh, so basically, we decouple the improvements between model improvements and data improvements, where we train our model also on the same data set as CDVAE, and we're realizing a a one point five improvement was coming from the model where the other 1.8 improvements was coming from the data scaling. And another key metric is how, how far away the generative structures are from a, a DFT relaxed structure, basically equilibrium structure. And so again, we see a three times decrease uh, in the MSD and another uh, from the model and another 5.6 times decrease uh, from the data. And at the end, the RMSCD is actually very small, 0.003 or 4, uh, 4, which was uh, kind of uh, much smaller than the size of the atom. So, which is very quite good here. So, we're also looking at whether or not our, our model are still generating diverse crystals, right? Even if you are scaling into, say, 1 million crystals. So, we did this experiment. And we found that uh, the percentage of uh, unique structure drops from 100% to around 86.2% uh, 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 after scaling into 1 million crystals. And uh, the percentage of a novel and uh, unique, uh, sorry, novel, uh, doesn't change, uh, stay at around 70%. Do you know the 100 million have points contains yeah. all unique uh, structures? Uh, no, the seven point. Uh, I said uh, eighty. Oh, my data set. Yes, yes, everything unique. Go ahead. Yeah. That number comprises the whole thing, or only for structures that passes on. Sorry, uh, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Uh, what? Uh, this. Oh no, these are all. No, these are only generated structure. So we take all the generated structure and we use DFT to relax it to its equilibrium structure and I compute the difference. Yeah, but uh, here in your generated structures, you uh, have everything. that are everything. Yeah. So not just, not, not just, no, not just yeah, everything, yeah.
but it will not be so different. I, I don't think it will be so different. Yeah, but that, that's a good point. Yeah, any more questions? Okay, let's move on. What time is Yes, okay, good. Yeah, I will, I have this, uh, another section that talks about the condition and generation, but uh, I have additional examples. I think I'll talk more about the algorithm aspects uh, because this is a ML like seminar, but uh, I mean, I'll skip a lot of the chemistry result aspect. Uh, okay, so, so far we've been talking about the conditional score network, right? Uh, so uh, unconditional <laughs> score network, which you are just generating normal and stable material. But this is not very useful because the eventual goal is that you want to generate the materials that are useful, right? So you want to generate a battery material, you want to generate a random material. So therefore, it's quite important to be able to do conditional generation. And we take this very classic approach called the classic Africanus, which was the same method that was used for uh, popular text image generating models like DALI2 or stable diffusion. So the, the big idea was that uh, you, kind of, uh, you, you can derive this equation using Bayes' rule and then it's a kind of like a summation over an unconditional score, conditional score weighted by this gamma vector, which is scalar number uh, that weights these two terms. And uh, so therefore the important thing is how would you learn this conditional score now, right? So it's quite easy. So you can just uh, take your conditional, uh, conditional label, right? And then you, kind of, uh, you can train this conditional model just by sampling uh, just by drawing, uh, by, 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 by training the model uh, and a condition on this additional label, uh, then you get this conditional score network. Uh, so, however, this is pretty standard, right? Also for text image generating models, but uh, there's actually a, a, a slightly difference between a conditional generating model for materials versus text image generating models that resulted in different model design choices that we have. Uh, so there are two major differences. The first one is that uh, we have many different properties or chemistry that you want to condition on, right? So they all live in a different uh, space. Uh, this is very different from text, where all the text, they live in a shared space uh, of text embedding space, right? So that's a, that's a difference. Uh, so the second thing was that uh, the conditional data is actually very sparse. Uh, so it's much more expensive to compute the property of the material uh, compared with just the relaxing whether or not the material is stable. So usually you have, a, a, you have many, many material structures, but only a small percentage of them, you will have the labels. So how do you, so taking this into account, we use fine tuning as the main approach for us to achieve a conditional label, uh, to achieve a unconditional model from, un, uh, from an unconditional model. So basically we start with a unconditional model that is trained in the way that I described earlier. Uh, but we actually add this uh, additional MLP for each different condition, right? So this main bulk score network, they are shared for all the different uh, downstream conditional models. But for each individual condition, we have this MLP that kind of encodes this condition into an embedding and then add this embedding into the node embedding at the each layer of the of the graph neural network. So in here, we actually take this uh, trick from so-called uh, uh, control net, uh, but the idea was that you just initialize the weights of this MLP, uh, weights and bias of this MLP into all zeros. Uh, but so therefore at the beginning, right, you're not altering any outputs for the main score network. And then, uh, uh, so during the training, it will become non-zero and kind of gradually altering the outputs of the main score network. And that's how we do conditional generation. Uh, so given this, we actually fine tune our unconditional model so that it can condition on many different constraints, including chemistry, uh, symmetry, and the properties. So given the time, I'm probably not going to talk about that. So I'm gonna maybe have a bit of a time if you have questions about uh, the conditional generation component. Uh, otherwise, I can move forward. So if your questions, you can ask now. Uh, no, okay, then I think I'll move forward. Uh, so I, I think I will probably only talking about the, the property conditional generation. Let me move there. Uh, oops, already here. Yeah, so the most important, uh, one of the most important uh, downstream tasks 
is that you wanted to be able to generate the materials condition on properties that you're interested in, right? So, so basically you want to replace this paradigm, right, of a screening just by directly generating the final uh, three to 10 candidates in the lab. Uh, but that's maybe too obvious, uh, uh, ambitious, but uh, we still want to do additional filtering, but that's what we want to do. Uh, so therefore we, I think this is actually the first time that you show that you can actually conditionally generate a materials condition on many different kind of property constraints uh, for, for a generative model. This is the first time uh, we were able to show that in this community. And uh, so we show that a model can generate a materials condition on targeting the magnetic property, uh, uh, electronic property like band gap, and also bulk modulus, which measures the hardness of the material. So in here, this blue distribution, uh, so this purple distribution was a distribution that we generate. And this, dot, uh, this like uh, dotted line is our target, while the, the, the green distribution was the data distribution. And uh, for each task, we have different number of data. As I said, it's much more expensive to generate populated labels compared with uh, uh, full data. So you, you, I think one, one key thing you were realizing that we were able to shift the general distribution uh, usually very far away from the data distribution for all this, these properties. As I said, this is the first time it was, we can demonstrate that uh, in this community. And uh, so more, more importantly, especially for the magnetic density and also the, for the bulk modulus, we are actually able to shift this data distribution to the top one or even top 0.1 percentile in the data distribution, which I think is pretty impressive because in most of the materials design problems, you're looking for generating materials with very extreme properties, right? So like a room temperature superconductor, but that's probably still a bit farther away <laughs> but, uh, for our model, yes. So these are some of the structures we're generating for each one of them all look reasonable. And uh, oh, this is an additional plot really to show that uh, uh, our generative model can outperform screening-based method. Because uh, for screening-based methods, you're based on this initial set of candidates, you, can, you end up run out, right? So, so therefore this curve kind of, a, if you increase the computation budget, this curve saturates, while the generative model just keeps generating novel materials. So I think that's a key advantage of generative model over conventional screening. Uh, so I'm also going to skip this, but this is kind of a more realistic example that we apply the method into a joint, uh, joint property, uh, joint materials design problem. We're trying to design a magnetic material with low supply chain risk. Uh, let me directly come into the end. So, so in summary, uh, we have demonstrated a manager, uh, which is uh, one of the first towards the first universal generator, right? For inorganic materials, I described the diffusion process. I described how we can train a state-of-the-art generative model for inorganic materials. We discussed how you can fine tune this for a diverse set of different constraints. Uh, finally, we show a more realistic um, materials design problem. So let me end with a little bit of an outlook into the future, because I think right now we're really in a paradigm shift in the community to going from screening based material generation, which has been extremely successful in the past 10 years, towards a generation based material design. Uh, because if you're looking at a similar uh, industry, like a pharma industry, generative model has really already been a standard tool in the, in, in the industry, where pharma companies have been using generative model to design drugs that goes into the clinical trial. So therefore, uh, my, my own prediction was that this will also happen in the next maybe one, two, three, one year, two years, three years, in the material industry, well, this kind of generative model based tools will be more widely adopted uh, in the industry. So I, I give a bit of an outlook, right? So that why this is so important, why this is so exciting, because a lot of the key material design problems were really, really looking for these materials with yeah. these extreme properties that it was approaching what is allowed by physics, right? So we, we don't know if it exists a room temperature superconductor. And for that way, we're looking for these uh, uh, materials that you can conduct a lithium ion super, super fast compared with any normal materials, right? So it's always the problem about finding a material whose uh, property approaching the physics limitations. So traditionally, we've been using screening-based methods where you kind of expand this period of front, but uh, not, not really targeted, right? Because you're exploring Noble materials are unconditional. 
So this conditional generation capability for genetic models is really allow you to do targeted generation materials given for these properties, uh, which provides a way to potentially push the boundary that is allowed by the physics. So the question I want to end up with was that with this kind of new tools really allow us for discover breakthrough materials, right? For a broad range of problems that are very, that are really uh, uh, that, that are really the cornerstone of uh, many technologies uh, that we're facing today, like superconductors, like solar cells, uh, like battery materials. So I look forward to the future for the next uh, one or two years. And thank you very much for your listening. Oh, sorry, I ended with one slide. Today and the tomorrow is, is Chinese New Year. So uh, happy Chinese New Year for everybody. Who, yeah. Thank you. Okay, yeah, we have uh, five minutes, unfortunately. Okay, but let's go for, okay, so we should, <laughs> okay, you, you choose. Okay, so yeah, the, 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 we, know, we talk a lot, so the, the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. I think that makes total sense. Yes. Uh, so yeah, I think that one thing to note is that a lot of these, right? So they are based on computation, right? So usually you can only compute the properties once you know the physics, but that is one thing, but you can also train this with experimental data that you have things that uh, maybe it's beyond uh, the physics that is already known, but you might be able to generate candidates. Then, but those candidates in order to validate, you have to use experiments. So both are very hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, that's a great question. So uh, first, like for small jug-like molecules, right? There's tons and tons of work. But uh, if you're talking about uh, uh, organic materials, also periodic, meaning organic crystals, uh, I have not seen work that has done this, but obviously it's easy to kind of extend this work into, into organic molecules. You also mentioned amorphous, right? So that's also doable, but uh, also, I think it's just, uh, you, you will gradually see probably in one or two years, this kind of works. Yeah. Uh, so the other side the back, yeah. Uh, so what do you mean by small molecules? Yes, so for organic, uh, there has a, it's actually an easier problem to do organic where uh, materials, uh, there's like, uh, I would say it's like one year, two year ahead uh, compared with uh, periodic stretches. So I think uh, the difficulty to do inorganic materials is really how do you do the periodicity, this kind of things, that makes it harder. But, uh, but if you don't do that, it's actually pretty straightforward just to do a normal, like, uh, 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 let's say, a variance preserving uh, diffusion over atom coordinates and then learn a score now for, for that. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's, it's, uh, there's a extensively studied uh, already. Yeah. Wait, do you want to ask a question? <laughs> Yes. In the trying to uh model, actually you have the energy from the spurt, then from the spurt. Yep. Yeah, that's a great question. So we actually did that in we actually do have a so in some of our version of the model, it's actually jointly conditioned on both the property and also the energy. And then if you condition on the energy, you can kind of shift this into more like a lower energy structure as well. So we actually do that. That improves the model performance. Uh, yeah, that's a way to do that. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, sorry. Uh, Dr. Sir, you're going to be the next year, but uh, okay. you're going to be the last, okay? Uh, so we'll give you a catch up, okay? But uh, let's see. Thank you very much.